Hey peeps, my name is Nick, this is Board Game Brawl, and it's time for another segment in my Top 100 Games 2015 edition. I'm counting down the Top 100 Games that I love the most right now at this point in time, and today we are doing 30 through 21. We are getting closer and closer to the top, and so the cream is starting to rise at this point. The, I mean, I love every game that's on my list, but these are like the most amazing games, the ones that I would drop anything to play right this second. We're getting closer to the ones that I just adore more than anything else. And of course, we have these second opinions from the Board Game Geek crew. So if you don't like my opinion, maybe you'll agree more with theirs because they are, I'm telling you, the, the brightest, most intelligent, funniest, attractive people who just, they, they just, uh, they disagree with me. And that's something, um, that's something a person would do. Yep. All right, let's do it. My number 30 is Thunderstone Advance. This is actually down eight spots from number 29. Once upon a time, this was my number one rated deck building game on my first top 10 deck building games list. I still love it. It's a great game, as evidenced by the fact that it's number 30 on my top 100 games. The fact of the matter is, this is also, of the deck builders that I love, this is like the longest one. That is the only reason why I don't get it to the table more often, but I will say this. Every time I've played it, I've had a blast. Every time that I've introduced it to new people, even people who... I wouldn't typically introduce such a heavy game to, they still enjoy it. So that's got to count for something. And it's just a fantastic thematic deck builder. So a lot of people, this was like the first major deck builder, or one of the first major deck builders that came out in the wake of Dominion. And a lot of people were like, oh, especially if you look through the negative comments from uh, back in those days, were like, oh, this is just a touch, such a total ripoff of Dominion. Not really at all. I mean, yes, there is deck building in this game, but the fact of the matter is, you're, you're getting adventurers and you're leveling them up and you're going to a dungeon and you're getting items and magic spells and companions and you're you're using all these things to fight monsters in a dungeon it is taking the dominion mechanism and just like flourishing i mean it's taking it into this whole other level of thematic goodness and so it's really great playing it in the epic uh the, the epic variant is also incredibly fun but you can really play it anyways i don't I don't really mind the normal version of it at all. There's tons of expansions out. I am afraid to say that it is, at this point in time, out of print. It's like everything for it is out of print. And I don't know if it'll be coming back in print anytime soon or at all. Um, I hate to say that, but that looks to be the case. So you might want to snap it up now, although I wouldn't pay exorbitant prices for it. Because, as you will see, there are better deck builders. But still, this is a fantastic one. That is Thunderstone Advance. I wouldn't bother with the original at all at this point from AEG. Uh, and uh, FinFan 2003 says, Good example of a dry deck builder that could be in the running for worst I've ever played. Dominion is still number one. Games should never feel like work. My number 29 is up five spots from number 34, so one of the few games that actually rose up on my list, and that is Shadow Hunters from Z-Man Games. This is one of the best party games I have. And I, you know, party game is kind of a loose thing to use here. It only accommodates up to, I think, eight players, maybe seven, no, seven or eight players. Uh, but still, it's fantastic. And everyone I played it with has either loved it or hated it. I will say that much because it is very, very random. Everything you do in the game is just rolling some dice and hoping for the best. But what's fun about the game is the hidden deduction element. It's a team game, sort of. You're either on the Hunter's team, the Shadow's team, or you're one of the independent neutral characters. And you all have different win conditions. Hunters want to kill the Shadows. Shadows want to kill the Hunters, or if there's enough people in the game kill a certain amount of neutral characters, I think two or three of them. Uh, or uh, if you're the neutral characters, all bets are off. You have a, Every uh, neutral character has a completely different ability. It might be getting a ton of items, it might be being the first person to die or killing a bunch of other people, all these different types of things. But it's so fun fig trying to figure that out and seeing like, why did you attack me? Because you were there, but we might be on the same team. Well, you don't know that I'm on the same team as you. Maybe I know something you don't know. It's really cool how you use hermit cards to figure out who people are. It's great. It's really dumb in a lot of ways, and it is very random. It's certainly light, but ah, uh, I just love it, and everyone I've ever played it with, for the well, not everyone, but <laughs> a lot of people I've played it with have loved it. Some people have absolutely hated it, but that's just going to happen with a lot of games, and especially with this one, it would seem. I would also highly recommend, there is actually, I don't typically do this at all for any of my games, but uh, a Board Game Geek user, Storm Knight, who may or may not have done one of the <laughs> second opinions on one of these uh, entries, 
he loves this game too, and he actually did um, some fan-made characters for the game that you can find in the file section of Shadowhunters on BGG. They're great. Now, there's other fan-made characters for Shadowhunters that are terrible. Avoid those files like the plague. You'll know them as soon as you see them. But the ones that Storm Knight did are fantastic. I use them all the time. It's just a little bit of homebrewing and sleeving to get them to work. Otherwise, do it. That is Shadowhunters, my number 29, Rabid Schnauzer. Aside from having a great name, says, Beware, one of the players has a murder ray. <laughs> My number 28 is another big mover and shaker. It's up 14 spots from number 42, and that is Fury of Dracula. And not only did I play this a lot earlier in the year, but of course the new edition of Fury of Dracula just came out about a month, month and a half ago, and I've gotten more plays of it, and it's just like fantastic they made a good game way better i didn't know how many problems there were with the old one quite frankly until i played this one because that's all i ever knew to judge from and in fact if fantasy flight games had only put out a reprint of the second edition as people had been clamoring for for years because the second edition was going for buku bucks online everything would have been fine people would have been happy i think but by putting out a third edition revamping it um getting you know really taking some of the the bad parts out of the combat system improving the way that you travel all these different things and improving the length of the game they really made it into something special if you're not familiar with it it's a one versus all game one player is dracula and this is like dracula brom stoker's dracula it's really a little, at least a little bit more akin to the classic tale than a, like a modern retelling. Uh, it's one player is Dracula, the other players are the famous hunters like Van Helsing and uh, Mina Harker and all these different people, and they are trying to capture Dracula. But Dracula is moving via hidden movement around the map, like Scotland Yard. He uses these. The best thing about the game, the thing I love the most, is the card system. How he puts out different cards representing where he's traveled, and the hunters can try and find that trail and go after him and reveal those cards on the trail to get closer and closer to him. But as Dracula is moving along these cards, he's dropping down traps, assassins, lightning bolts, uh, vampire bats, and, uh, and also vampires, young vampires that can mature and get him closer to winning the game. It's just incredibly thematic. It's one of the most thematic games that I have in my collection. It's a great fun, lots of tension. It's fun no matter which side you play, but especially Dracula, of course. And I'm glad for the new edition that everyone can play it now. That is Fury of Dracula, the third edition from Fantasy Flight Games. Alec 2 says, Big disappointment. Too long, feels not balanced. Playing Dracula is more fun, and combat is like rock, paper, scissors. Random and dull. My number 27 is one of four brand new games on this segment of the list. This one is called Medieval Academy, and this was right at the beginning of 2015. In fact, I played an edition of the game, I still own an edition of the game, that I think came out at Essen of 2014, but it has since gotten a wider release from Yellow. You should have no problem finding it. I don't think it's sold out or anything. This is a very light family weight card drafting game. If you've ever uh, played with people who said, I can't really get into the iconography of Seven Wonders, but I still like card drafting, or maybe I've played Sushi Go, but that's a little bit too simple for me. I think that Medieval Academy is going to be the perfect uh, game to fit into that spot. This is all about, uh, the theme is a little bit paced on, not a little bit paced on, it's very paced on, but you're supposed to be uh, taking a young knight or a, some, a group of young knights and trying to elevate them along these different tracks to make them better knights. You want to please the king, you want to uh, try and get to the princess in the tower, you want to fight uh, the black knight or, or bet against the white knight or the against the black knight or vice versa, and you want to uh, be going to scholarly suits and help the poor all these different nightly things that you should be taking care of and you're doing this by card drafting of different cards that will affect each of these tracks and you move your little discs along the way uh, but there's a lot of really interesting interactions in the game it's very very interactive because you're constantly battling it out on these tracks if you land on top of someone else's disc you're going to gain the bonus and you push them back but there's different uh, tracks that affect other tracks and there's different penalties and points you're taking along the way it's very simple at its core, but there's a lot of depth and strategy, a surprising amount to it, and it's got fantastic artwork from uh, Piera, which is just, it's, a, it's amazing. I love that artwork. And there's also a lot of variants that work very well, surprising. A lot of games that have a ton of variants, and only a few of them work. Most of them are at least worth checking out in Medieval Academy. So that is Medieval Academy, currently from Yellow Games and originally from Blue Cocker Games. Uh, that is my number 27. Crockpot, however, I, I love these names, says, boring, soulless, somewhat interesting. <laughs> Thank the heavens that this game is short. <laughs> boring, soulless, somewhat interesting. 
vote below if you want that to become the new tagline for my channel. <laughs> now, I'm not entirely sure because I actually haven't run all the metrics for my list quite yet. We'll, we'll cover that all when we get to my uh, outro video, my wrap up. But I, I do believe the biggest mover upper, <laughs> so to speak, is my number 26, which is five tribes, which moved up 45 spots from number 71. There's a couple of different reasons for this. Five Tribes, I had only gotten my copy you know, very close to when I made my top 100 list last year. And it's saying something that it got up to number 71 that quickly. That's how great I thought the game was. But I hadn't explored its depths. I hadn't played it with a lot of different groups of people. I have gotten a lot of plays of that game in, in the past year. And it's grown on me more and more. On top of that, an expansion came out, the uh, Artisans of Nakala, which is great. It, it really helps the game. I don't think it's going to change anyone's mind about the game. You can watch my review about it, and I'll say basically the same thing. But for people who at least like the game, it's going to make it much, much better. More variety, different things to do. The art, whole artisans and how they uh, get their uh, their artifact tokens, things like that, works very, very well. So that those things all together in conjunction really skyrocketed this one up the list. And it's just an amazing game. You, uh, it's a uses a Moncala mechanism of. Uh, picking, you know, the Moncala is picking up stones and putting them in different dishes and then doing something in the last dish, something like that. In Five Tribes, you are picking up all these meeples very loosely thematically representing tribes of uh, the Arabian Nights and picking them up and moving them around the board and dropping them in different tiles. And wherever you drop the last one, you're going to perform a certain action based on what that meeple pairs up with, one or more other meeples. And it could be assassinating other meeples or uh, going to the market and shopping and uh, with the expansion, getting these artifact tokens, all of these different things that you can do. And it's a brain-burning game. The length of the game can be an issue with certain people, especially if they're prone to analysis paralysis, because you can sit there and be like, Okay, I've got a plan. I'm going to move this to this to this to this to this. And then the next player in line can to totally screws up all of your plans and it's back to square one for you. So it gets so there's almost no point in planning between rounds or between it when it comes from your turn back to your turn again. Uh, but you can do your best. And uh, I just love the puzzly aspect of it and trying to do your best and the different routes to victory and the gin cards which you can gain a hold of. Lots and lots of fun stuff here. And it looks gorgeous. The components are amazing in true Days of Wonder fashion. It is from Days of Wonder and now Asmodee. That is Five Tries by number 26. Again, it moved up 45 spots from number 71. However, Zestras Nokia has a different opinion. Oh, sweet mother of Jesus, the downtime. Never again. My number 25 is brand new to the list. It's from Fantasy Flight Games, and it is their current big epic space battle territory control game, although they have another one from a certain very obscure license that will be coming out within the next few months uh, called Rebellion. But this one is called Forbidden Stars, and it's set in the Warhammer 40k universe. You are taking control of one of the iconic factions, either the, uh, was it the Eladrin? Not the Eladrin. Is it the Eladrin? No, 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 no. Those are D&D. Uh, &D. Whatever the space elves are. <laughs> I can't remember. I, I'm blanking on the name. Uh, then you've got the uh, the Chaos Forces and the Imperial Army and the Orcs. And you've got these different factions who have spaceships and uh, ground troops. But what you're it's not like uh, the Warhammer's miniature game where it's like uh, ground-level miniatures combat. Instead, you're actually going from system to system trying to conquer worlds and trying to get certain objective tokens. If you're the first person to get all, meet all of your objective tokens by conquering worlds uh, deep in enemy territory, you're going to win the game. Sometimes if the game drags on too much, it's going to come down to just who did the best if it goes down to his logical uh, round ending conclusion which I think is like eight rounds uh, but man there's a lot of stuff to love here first off the combat system is amazing it's amazing the whole the, you use card combat together with dice representing all of your different units you can actually filter out the cards you don't want from your deck as you can upgrade you can uh, get rid of cards you don't like put in brand new cards that are much much better at least for whatever your particular strategy is you can get um the, the whole command system is amazing too it's uh based off of uh what they did in the game starcraft years ago uh the starcraft the board game where you put out these tokens representing the different types of orders you want to use during the course of the game, a token in all the different systems, but then uh, your opponents might put tokens on top of yours, and they're resolved from top to bottom, so you're like, okay, I'm definitely going to recruit here, but if uh, so your enemy forces move in first and populate the plants, you're like, oh, wait a minute, 
you know, or something like that might happen. So I love the way that you have to constantly be thinking about how the orders are going to be resolved in order to get the drop on your enemy. And you can upgrade those tokens with cards as well. Oh, such a great game. It's a little bit long. It is Ameritrashy and random for sure, but there's a lot of things I just love about the game that are really unique and innovative. And where's my expansion for it already? Okay, I'm not going to be one of those complainers. But that is Forbidden Stars. New to the list, but easily my number 25. Uh, Repli, or Rpli, says, Too long, too convoluted, too Ameritrashy for my taste. Too many hours of my life wasted playing a single game. I'll give you a pass because you actually used the correct term, Ameritrash. <clears throat> My number 24 also moved up. There's a lot of uh, games in this segment of the list that are faring very well. This one is Dixit from Asmodee and Libelud. This is one of the... Uh, I keep saying this. Uh, I guess I have more party games on my list than I had anticipated, but it, this is a fantastic party game. And again, much like with Shadowhunters, it's hard to classify it as a party game only because it doesn't handle like an immense amount of players. And it's not like a jumping up and shouting and laughing hysterically type of game. It's This is called the Gamer's Party Game, and that sounds very elitist, so I don't know if I, te- I technically ascri- uh, ascribe that to this game, because I've also played it with so quote-unquote civilians to the board gaming world, and it's been a big hit, because this is a storytelling game that works. I have huge problems with a lot of storytelling games, and I don't. this one skirts the boundaries of that uh, genre, but it definitely is, and it definitely just feels better it feels gamier and it feels like you can actually be creative and be skillful in this game and do very very well all it is you have one player is a storyteller they have a card with some very abstract artwork there's a bunch of different expansion sets all with different artists almost all of them are amazing looking uh but it has very surreal looking trippy artwork you'll you'll take the card without showing it to anyone Say something about it. Say a word. Say a phrase. Make a sound. Whatever it might be. Say a whole paragraph if you really want to. And put it face down on the table. Everyone else has to take a card from their hand that they think matches your description. And then they're shuffled up. They're put down. They're flipped over. Everyone votes on which one they think is the real storytellers. Everyone else gets points for people that accidentally vote on their card. And there's the whole interesting thing of how the storyteller wants to be specific enough that at least one person guesses their card correctly but not so specific that everyone does. And how that scoring works is fascinating. It's hard to wrap your head around the first time, but it's one of the best things about the game. I love the artwork and the presentation and just how it gets creative juices flowing, but also how it can rely on some skill as well. At least it's the skill of trying to read people and figure out the group. That is Dixit, my number 24. I love it more and more as the years go by. Mick Jarvis disagrees and says, party game I pull out for people who can't think strategically. My number 23 is brand new to the list, and it is the hottest game right now. How do I know that? Because Board Game Geek said so. It is at the top of their hotness list. Of course, I'm talking about the advent calendar for this year. No, it's actually Pandemic Legacy, which has been... its First off, it has skyrocketed up to the number three spot on the Board Game Geek list top 100, which, of course, has infuriated the people who hate the game or who just think that no game should rise up that quickly. There are dozens of threads, maybe hundreds of threads at this point on the forums for the game that go on for hundreds of pages talking about why this game is either the savior of board gaming or the antichrist of board gaming, or maybe a little from column A, a little from column B. And (laughs) I just love the spectacle of it. Now, you'll notice that it is not like the number one game on my list, and I'm not even sure that it's going to make the... I mean, it's going to be on my... Well, okay, spoilers, I guess. It's probably going to make my top 10 of the year, but not in the top spot, because I don't think it's all that, because it's still based on Pandemic. And the fact is, I'm not even sure, even as high as Pandemic placed last year, I'm not sure that that game would have made this list if Pandemic Legacy didn't replace it anyways, because I just crashed on Pandemic. I got so bored with it. I played it so much. Every expansion for it I played, and I played every expansion, just felt like this is the same game with some mechanics I don't care about. They just feel completely tacked on, and my opinion of the game just plummeted. Pandemic Legacy revitalized the whole thing to the point where I'm like, this should have been the game the whole time. I can't believe anyone would ever play Norman Pandemic anymore. That's how I feel. I know that's ridiculous, but that's genuinely how I feel. I will never go back, even if I... I haven't completed Pandemic Legacy yet, so no spoilers, please. But even if I complete the entire game and it's just a useless lump there, I'll still say, you know what? That was fantastic. Maybe in 10 years, I'll do it again. I don't want to play the regular Pandemic anymore. If you don't know what it is, it's the regular game of Pandemic about you cooperatively working together to cure 
uh, four different diseases out on the map of the world uh, before they outbreak and kill the population. But pandemic legacy changes over time. Everything could potentially change. And there's not much I can say specifically, but you get special, you each get characters with different special powers, just like in regular pandemic, but now they can change over time and get stronger or weaker. Uh, you have these viruses, which might get stronger or weaker or change in different ways over the course of the game. There's special events that happen. Things happen to the cities and areas on the board. Everything could potentially change, and it's amazing storytelling experience. I love it. And there are people who hate the game because they are just like so in love with the physical components of board games to an unhealthy degree to the point where they're like, I can't damage a game that's inconceivable. And I cannot understand these people. I can't. I think they're having an argument that people on my side of the aisle are just like bewildered by. Because the whole point of the game is to have skin in the game. If you if there's no stakes, if you're not permanently altering anything, I mean, these people want to like change the game in such a way that it is not permanent, that they can like alter the game components to be reusable. That is completely missing the point. And I'm sorry if you disagree with me. That's genuinely how I feel. The whole point of this game, even if it is a one and done, one being like tw- maybe up to 20 games thing, but even if that's the case, I think... It needs to be that way for there to be as much enjoyment as there is because everything you do in the game feels momentous. That's what I love about it. That is Pandemic Legacy from Z-Man Games from Matt Leacock and Rob Davio of Risk Legacy fame. You will also not find Risk Legacy on my list because I think this game also killed my appreciation for that one. Well, I still appreciate that game, but I just don't want to ever do it again. Uh, (laughs) Now, Kiraboshi speaks for a lot of people in the ratings on Board Game Geek. A lot of people rating this game a 1 for the same general reasons. And I think that Kiraboshi sums it up quite nicely. I fully admit it crumbles my cookies to see something as bad as this shoot up in the ranking. Defies description as a game, which is the overtext for a one rating, is very apt. Games have common knowledge rules by definition. I've explained and defended my remarks extensively in the forums, and now I'm quite done with this shitty game. My number 22 has fallen down seven spots from number 15 last year. That's not a huge drop. I still love this game. I just haven't played it as much in the past year. Maybe I played it one time in the past year. Otherwise, it would be uh, up a little bit further or would have stayed the same. But again, don't panic if you also love this game. It's not a huge drop. That is Ghost Stories from Antoine Bauza and Repos Productions slash Asmodee. Fantastic cooperative game, incredibly difficult, brutally difficult cooperative game with an awesome theme of you being like Shaolin monks who are trying to protect this town from evil spirits and this dark lord who like Wu Fang or something from the Legend of the Five Rings universe reminds me of, uh, who is trying to uh, resurrect himself with the hope of all these ghosts that are flooding into the town. You need to kill all the ghosts, fend them off. It's a tower defense game, which I never really thought about it as until I saw the game Besieged uh, on Kickstarter, which is very reminiscent of that. And I'm like, huh. I guess Ghost Stories is kind of a tower defense game. But I love the bits. I love the pieces. I love the artwork also from Piero. Um, I love the the idea of it, the getting the special powers. Every monk feels distinct and different in what they can do. And also utilizing the abilities of the village tiles to your benefit against the oncoming waves. It's a brutally difficult game. In the beginning, you're like, yeah, I think we can do it. Then it gets like, oh, I think we probably can't. And then at the end, it's like, how are we going to win? This is not good. And I just love that feeling. And... You do lose a lot, but you win enough to make it think like the game is beatable, even though it usually isn't, but it's enough for me. That is Ghost Stories from Asmodee and Repos. <laughs> uh, sometimes I have a problem with the publisher's names. In any case, Ace Ace Baby has a plan for this game. Step one, find someone who knows the game to teach it. Step two, realize nobody else needs to play the game. My number 21 is another new game to the list, and this one is called Spyfall. This, I'm not sure if this is my highest ranked party game. I probably should have researched that ahead of time, but we'll go through all that in my final thoughts for the whole list. But man, oh man, I love this game. From the second I played it, I loved it. I tracked down a Russian version of the game and then snapped up the uh, English version when it finally came out stateside. Now I mixed together exclusive decks from both of them and have tons of different decks to work with. If you don't know about the game, 
One player is a spy. The other players are something or others, not spies, good guys, I guess I call them. And the spy, for whatever bizarre reason, the game makes no thematic sense, has been dropped behind enemy lines, gets amnesia, can't remember where he or she is. The other, and this is represented by him having a spy card face down in front of him that just says spy on it. The other players have a location. They all have the exact same location card. Could be the beach, could be a train, could be a hotel, could be a submarine, could be a space station. The point is, they all know where they are. But they don't know which of the other players is the spy who doesn't know where they are. And the whole game is asking questions. You can ask whatever you want. You can say, what's the weather like? You can say, what are you wearing? How did you get here? Where are you going after this? What's that smell? Whatever you want to ask, you ask to someone, and then they have to ask somebody else. The point is trying to suss out information. The spy has to sort of bluff and lie and make up like, oh, um... I'm wearing what I would normally wear. But hopefully you're a little less vague than that, but not so specific that you're going to give it away that you're just, you have no idea where you are. Whereas the other players, because the spy is trying to guess where they are, the other players can't be too specific, even if they would want to be, to let the other players know not to be suspicious of them. And if they trip up, trip up in their description, the other players are going to be like, well, why did you say that? Or you're the spy! I love this game. It's so much fun. I would play it right now. And the great thing about it is that it's fast. You will play like 10 games in a row, I guarantee it, if you like it at all. That's how fast and fun it is. I love it. That is Spyfall, my number 21. The last one for today. Oscari, however, says, say it with me now, not a game. Ding. And that is it for today's list. Thank you so much for joining me. We're getting closer and closer to the top 10. I can't wait. Stay tuned. Take care. Take care.